So Kylie is the National Safe Work and Wellbeing Manager for Good Start Early Learning. She leads the organisation's Safe Work and Wellbeing Unit and is responsible for health and safety of the big and little people in Good Start Centres. Kylie's innovative approach to safety, rehabilitation and infectious disease management has established Good Start as an industry leader in these fields. She is passionate about uh, the early learning sector and dedicated professionals who work within it. Again, you'll see the focus is on people here. She's a board member of Play Australia, member of the Consumer Product Industry Research Advisory Group and co-chairs the National Safety Working Group for the Early Learning and Care Council of Australia. Please welcome Kylie. How does this work? <laughs> Couldn't go terribly wrong with technology. Good. Thank you. Um, I also have a tendency towards jazz hands, so apologies if I <laughs> knock anything over on you. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land um, on which we meet meet on today. Um, I want to respect. Rep I want to pay my respects um, to their elders, past, present and future, and also recognise their families who lived, worked and played um, on this land. I also really want to recognise the dedicated professionals in the room here today. Um, you have one of the most important jobs in society right now. You're shaping and educating and guiding the future leaders um, of the country. And that's a pretty amazing thing when you reflect on um, what you do. I'd also, as part of my um, session today, I'd like to give you some insights into what we've been doing at Good Start Early Learning over the last couple of years. Um, and our real focus on, um, as Matt touched on, that safety, health and well-being of our people. Um, because without our people, um, our centres can't run. There's some things that I've learned about early learning. And um, when I think about my own career, when I left school, I went into childcare. It seemed like a great job for an 18 um, year old woman who wanted to work with young children. Um, I worked in the sector for a number of years and then moved out to social services, into nursing, which is how I actually came full circle back into early learning and doing that rehabilitation um, from the other side of the fence from um, when I used to actually work in a centre. There were three things that I found coming back 20 years later into, into early learning that never really changed. One of them was that we always put children and families first. And that's a really inherent part of what we do. But what, what happens when to us as, whoop, don't touch that. Uh, what happens um, to educators? How do they care for themselves? What emphasis do they put on their well-being? Um, how do they look after their mental health? You know, the job that we do can be really challenging. Sometimes we see things that other people don't see when it comes to child protection, um, dealing with children who have epilepsy, anaphylaxis. It's a really, really stressful position. So thinking about how we actually have that self-care piece. The resources that are in our centres are not always designed for big people. Um, and they're not designed for comfort. And I'm pretty confident nearly every person in this room can recall trying to jam themselves onto one of those tiny little children's chairs. Okay, they're not made for the wider bottom folk. Um, they're actually weight rated for about 30 kilograms. So I probably couldn't tell you the last time I weighed 30 kilograms. Um, I'm pretty confident a lot of our workforce couldn't either. They're not designed um, for us to sit on. And there's also those pieces about cots as well. So being, having, being able to actually bend right down into a cot, a low base cot every day, puts a significant load on your back. You know, Sid talked about we come with a lot of underlying pathology and issues that we aren't even aware of. So how we work every day is actually really important. And there's a lot of the risk of injury in our sector is actually quite real. Okay, so when you're sitting and reading with children and another little friend comes along really excited to share a story with you and jumps on your back. Um, or you've got somebody who's not having the greatest start to the day and you're trying to grapple with their parent as they hand them over um, at drop off time. Those things actually impact really heavily um, on our educators. So there's also the cost aspect around what injuries cost us as a sector. 
all of you would go through the assessment and rating process. So the injuries that occur to our staff actually impact on the quality of care that we provide for children and families. So if you've got an educator who's been injured and they may not be able to be at work, what does that mean for care of the children in the room on that day? It means you have to shuffle around your routines and your rosters. Um, it means that you might have to get in a casual staff member to support and cover. And then what, when you actually have that disruption to routine, we actually see an increase in child injuries from there because things aren't running as smoothly as they always have. Um, and that causes sometimes a bit of unhappiness for families because they're out of routine as well, especially if you're trying to drop someone off who has that particular educator they have a great bond with and that person's not there. Good people leave our profession because they get injured. People don't come to work to go home needing surgery. Okay, so we want to try and retain educators in the business right up for, in our businesses for as long as we can because it's great to have that knowledge that someone who's maybe worked in our sector for 40 or 50 years, what they can actually bring in terms of experience, especially around guiding people who are just leaving school and coming into our profession. And it's also about money. So increasing premiums impact on your overheads now, in the media, right at the moment, I'm sure you're all aware, there's a whole lot of grappling about what that childcare package looks like in Canberra. So that's really important to families, but these are some of the things that actually, when you've got increasing premiums, can impact on your bottom line um, as a centre provider. Because if you're having to pay increasing premiums and you might have increasing wages for staff, you have to put up fees for families. And that also impacts as well. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the changes we made at Good Start, um, which we started on our journey around four years ago. We started to look at how our people were getting injured. So we were recording something like, and we have 650 centres around the country, we were, were recording around something like 200 to 250 injuries a month um, for our people. That's, that's quite a significant amount. And we started to go, What's going on here? What, what's actually happening to people? And we took a step back and had a look at our data and we used some of that information that Matt had up earlier around um, on Work Cover Connect. What, what were the, where were injuries coming from? And it was things like lifting children and equipment. It was tripping over things in the classrooms, slipping over on wet floors um, in the bathrooms. Um, it was slipping over on food um, on the floor, Vegemite sandwiches. <sighs> that can take you a long way. Um, it's those pieces, um, hitting heads on shelving. So when we set up a room, oh, I'm seeing lots of nodding. I always get lots of nodding when I say shelving. <laughs> um, it's that bit of when we set up a, a room, we're looking at creating an optimum environment for somebody at this height, but we're not sometimes thinking about the person at this height and what it means for them if they get that shelf in the eye. And you would have seen on Matt's data, wounds and lacerations were one of those sort of leading pieces. That's what happens when you get a shelf in the face. Um, we asked our people to start telling us about their injuries earlier, so we would find people would naturally go, oh, my back's feeling a bit sore. They'd persevere with it for a couple of days. They wouldn't let anyone know. They'd keep doing their regular job, so just causing a little bit more aggravation there. Um, they would then say, oh, I'm gonna go to the doctor. By this point, we're five days into it. The doctor says, oh my God, you work in childcare. You need to take two weeks off. That's a really, really hard job. Don't come back for two weeks. And by that point, and you know, you looked at Matt's data around when someone has 20 days, there's a 70% likelihood, all those things started to impact. So we started talking to people about, if you can tell us straight away when you've had an injury, we can start helping you straight away. And started to bring in that care piece around what we could do for them when something went wrong. Um, we focused on how we actually cared for them after the injury then. So if people had to have surgery and they were, were away, we would talk to with the centre director and say, do you think the children in that room where that educator is might be, might be able to make a card? Or would they like to make a little video that we could actually send to that person at home? And you'd be amazed how much that actually just brightens up somebody's day when they get that connection back in the workplace. Um, we know that our people are really connected to the children they care for and that feeling like they're still part of the workplace was really important. 
we put together a suitable duties register. So we went around with our people and when, if you had an injury where you have to wear a moon boot and you're on crutches, what do you think you could do? If you can only lift five kilograms, what does that mean? What do you think you could do? And we started to compile a list. And we also sought some advice from specialists around how we could incorporate that into our workplace so that we had a big list of things when someone actually had an injury that they could go through with their centre director and their doctor and tick them off together. So we had a little bit of medical guidance around what that looked like. And WorkCover Queensland, if you're looking for some help with that, on the web page um, on their website under um, childcare, they've actually got a list of suitable duties that you could print out and use at your centre. We started to invest in our people. So when we looked at what people were telling us, we went, okay, cots are actually causing quite a problem. Um, we'd had some discussions with the regulator in the safety regulator in Victoria, and they were talking about, they felt that childcare is actually a hazardous um, workplace, and they wanted us to do something about the cots. So we went from using those low base domestic cots, which lots of, lots of people have in their centres, um, to a high base cot. So it meant that when you were actually putting a, um, a child down for rest or an infant down for rest, instead of doing this action, coming over the top, suddenly the base was at this height and it was just stepping in here. And it made so much difference. Um, it then led to other pieces like children, the children were actually up higher and they could see when they stood up and woke up and they had a lot better engagement with the educators because they, they could see them through the glass. Um, so there were some other benefits in that as well. We began installing nappy change steps. So for people who work in that 18 months to two and a half years, some of those children are quite hefty to lift. Um, and especially if you're having to lift them all the time, can be quite difficult. So we started putting in nappy change steps. Um, if you were looking for specifications around what that could look like, WorkSafe Victoria have actually got a design that you could give a builder to actually build those for you. Um, and we put them in to help children, so an educator could help actually children navigate up the stairs rather than having to try and do that lift um, of an 18 kilogram two year old. We also purchased low adult chairs. So it talked a little bit about the bigger people on the little chairs. Um, we looked at what what else that could, what could that look like? Um, and there'd been a design phase already happening um, over a couple of years and we've got low adult chairs so nice wider bottoms so much more comfortable to sit on but allowing educators to actually sit at the height um, of children so if you had children interacting at a low table educators could sit down and do that as well but without the risk of the little plastic chair collapsing underneath them um, because that does actually happen and we've had that happen um, previously in our centres. We made people a priority so those first 48 hours after an injury, we really honed in on what do we need to do better to make this a really great experience for us, um, but also for um, our people. And how could we best support our centre directors as well? Um, as soon as someone got injured, we made sure that they also got first aid. So we're really great at providing first aid to children. Everyone's straight in there, first aid kits out. But what we found when it came to our adults, people didn't offer the same type of support. They just assumed because they were an adult, they were going to be able to look after themselves. But that was actually a really important part of making sure someone was okay. Um, and I'm sure Scott will touch on the importance of providing that type of care after, um, after an injury. We made sure we tried to organise doctors for people and support that connection where we could so that they got into a doctor straight away um, to get some support. And we would ring ahead to the doctor to tell them that someone was coming, this was the type of work that they were, they were doing and here's what we could do to support them um, from an alternative duties perspective. We always had a copy of the suitable duties read, ready to go and we talked to our people about it so they actually knew and expected that um, because sometimes our people also are in that mindset of if I've had an injury there's absolutely nothing I can actually do at the centre but when we looked at it there's, there's lots of things that people can do um, and it's about breaking it down into small pieces and making sure that that register actually talks to those small pieces so 
if it, your plan comes back for medical certificate comes back from the doctor and says you can only lift five kilograms I'm pretty sure lots of you like we were were going what does that actually mean um, and then we started to look at things like well five kilograms is two a4 reams of paper and if I lift that up and feel it I kind of get a bit of an idea for how much I'm able to lift um, and we started to look at things like if you can only lift five kilograms then how about you can you can do reading with the children you can do supervision you've got programming time um, let's look at you can still set up things like puzzles in the indoor area without having to go out and lift the outdoor equipment so it just changed the way we looked at it to being glass half full rather than glass half empty we made sure that we let WorkCover Queensland know straight away because they can actually start that process around gathering information and trying to decide whether the claim was or wasn't work related. Um, it's really easy when you know people or sometimes if you have a difficult working relationship to go, that did not happen at work. There's no way that happened here and I'm going to fight that for the next three months. And that actually just consumes the whole whole process and it stops being about your relationship with your staff member and starts being about the fighting and the arguing and that actually leads to people staying off longer and then generally plays out into things like I can't come back and work at that centre anymore, um, I think I've got anxiety or depression from this whole situation and it turns into something much bigger than it needed to be and always supporting return to work so we never budge on that. If someone has a workplace injury, there is something for someone to do and making it meaningful so they feel connected and part of the centre. If it means being at an, on administration and greeting parents in the morning and if they can't be there for the whole day, working around, maybe that is the right thing to do so they can keep connected with families and children. But finding something that's actually meaningful for people that they can do through the day. And we learnt from our mistakes. It's really easy to go, whoa, that injury happened, that was terrible. I hope that never happens again. And started going, how did that injury happen? What's going on in the playground? The AstroTurf's actually ripped. There's a big, um, there's a big lump in the, underneath the bark or underneath our outdoor area. And started doing things about it to actually fix them. Um, so trying to work with our people to look at the environment and start to identify some of those hazards there before they turned into an injury. We trained people in the things that they didn't understand or didn't know how to do well and we, we learnt what was going wrong from that data as I talked about before. So how writing a little sheet up about what to think about when you put up shelving in your centre, things to remember, um, right down to how much can what's the weight a shelf will hold because I'm sure you will have all seen the smiley space shelves where they've got too much things on them and they're just a little bit overloaded. Yep, trying to work through some of those as well from a safety perspective so that the shelf doesn't actually collapse at some point in time and land on someone's head. We are specialists um, for help. So people um, like these guys that are here today um, and talk to WorkCover about can they guide us in the direction of who could help us if we're grappling with a safety <laughs> issue. Um, there's great resources out there if you're a single provider or you have just a handful of centres. Early Childhood Australia has a great range of um, online resources that you can also look to to get some additional support. And there's no reason why you can't reach out to larger providers like Good Start. Um, and we're very happy to try and provide you with some guidance and support as well if you need a helping hand. Um, because that's important to us as well when we talk about what premiums look like. We're all in it together. And everything that each of us does impacts on how much we pay as well. So it's really important as a sector we come together to help each other. Um, and we made safety a priority over everything else. So the standard, we set that piece about the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So if you walked past that puddle on the floor and you didn't put a sign up to say slippery or you didn't go and get a mop, was that, what, what are you actually saying? You're telling people that it's all right for that to be there. And especially if you're a centre director or an area manager or have one of those leadership roles, um, you're setting the tone for what, what your centre looks like and what your people expect. So making sure that everybody understood um, that that was a really key part for us. 
we found that in the education and early learning sector, people really liked, we're, we're creative, innovative people. Um, and how we trained people in safety was really quite tricky because that technical jargon, you know what, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to safety professionals. So um, it's about how we break that down. We actually came up with an activity that we called I Spy. Um, so I Spy was about helping people look at their work environment, identify hazards or issues that were in it, come up with what ways they thought people would hurt themselves, and then talk about <coughs> what they would put in place to make it better if it was their centre. Um, we had some really amazing centres who took photos and owned what was in there and said, look, this is what I found today. Um, so this is a picture um, from one of our centres. Um, and I'm pretty sure you've all been in the prep room that might look like this at some point in time. Um, so we actually broke it down and went, what do you see wrong in this picture? So for you as the audience looking at this, what's one of the things you can see wrong here? Boxes yeah, the boxes and the clutter on the floor. Hazards. Yep, tripping hazards. <coughs> what else? Pardon? Well, not yeah, definitely. It's very tall. It is really tall. Yeah, and we have lots of injuries um, in our sector, but also in our centres, where people get up on those really high ladders um, and they fall off. And sometimes we have a tendency not to use ladders at all. We like chairs, tables, whatever's actually nearest to us. Anything else? It's paint and glue. Yeah. But chemicals is a really good example because we often see those um, unsecured as well. The mops that will never dry out. Yes, the mops that will never dry out. And imagine the smell that comes with that. So this was the activity that we went through with our people and they actually started to look at our centres a little bit differently in their environment and they started to take ownership because we would do this once a, once a month and people would start to see what was going on in their space and start to fix it before it happened. And what we actually started to see was our injury rate going down. So we could link this activity to actual improvements um, in how badly our people were getting hurt. And that's a pretty fantastic thing. And you picked up, ta-da, all, um, all of those hazards. But it's how you then take that and get your people to actually see those as well. Um, in your gift bags or your bags to take away, there's actually a copy of a facilitator's guide for this activity that talks through um, what we actually look at and how we write and what we do to um, give you maybe a little bit of inspiration about how you could do that at your centre. We tied it all together um, for something that we called Hearts and Minds. And Hearts and Minds became about the hearts piece being if we tell you these stories and we talk to you about how our people are injuring themselves and we talk to you about what that actually means. So that parent, that the single mother with three children who stood on a block and fractured her foot and now has a moon boot and crutches, how does she get home from work every day? How does she care for her own children? It's bigger than what's just happening at your centre. It's about what's happening at home for people as well and the impact on them. Um, we talked about the need for care. As I touched on, we'd send cards. When people have surgery, we send flowers. We want people to know that at Good Start, we care about them as a person. Um, and it's a really small gesture, but it goes a really long way. And if you think back to the last time you received flowers at work or for no special reason, think about how that made you feel and capturing that and thinking about what that would actually mean to someone else, especially someone who might not have any family or be socially isolated, that's a big reach out to them. Um, we focused on well-being, so we talked about we do, talked about things like centres getting a personal trainer in and trying to encourage everybody um, to work together as part of that. Um, as a business, we looked at our staff uniforms and we've been tracking it for about three years now. Um, we started out having about 800 people who wore between a 5XL and a 7XL. That's a, from a size perspective and a well-being perspective and personal health, that's really challenging. Um, so we've been able to see how that's slowly, and I do mean slowly, decreasing. So we took the option of then going, what else can we do about talking to people around things like 
if it's someone's birthday every day, don't eat the cake every day. Um, don't eat lunch with the children and then go and eat your own lunch as well. So trying to change just some of those behaviours um, that we actually saw at our centres. And when it came to minds, we started giving people data, so information to inform them about why these stories were important. And the balance of those two things together really brought together our safety and injury program. And it's been that that our people have actually bought into. Everyone benefits when you actually take that time um, to invest in your safety, health and well-being. Um, there's that piece around people. So your people know you care. And people, if you've ever gone in and looked at your centre on Google, you know, or on Seek, on Seek uh, people can leave reviews about your organisation and they leave reviews about things like that, about whether it was a safe environment. Parents are more informed about things like safety and they notice what type of safe environments you have in your centres. And I'm sure they challenge you even when it comes to things like children around what safety looks like for children, but they notice that for your people as well. Quality outcomes for children and families is really important. Assessment and rating is a really critical piece of what we do um, as a sector. And happy people equals motivated people who want to engage with families and drive um, really good outcomes for children. And it also means financial stability because you can stop giving money to these guys as much as we love you um, and start spending it on things like resources and playground upgrades. Um, being able to invest in professional development for your people so that you can actually start making a change. <clears throat> I think the really big thing to remember here <clears throat> is that everyone has to start somewhere. So if there's something that you've heard today that you want to explore a little bit further um, or you can take it away and start to work on it at your centre, you only have to take one step at a time and it's about leaving here and actually putting something from any of these speakers that you've heard into action um, because if you can make that change at your centre, not only does it benefit you but it benefits our children and our families um, and the broader community. So, thank you. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, having worked uh, with Kylie over a number of years now, the passion that she has for this industry and making change and getting better outcomes for everyone is probably clear to see. And I think the thing that is, even though they're a very large organisation,